Hey everyone, it is Nathan Fletcher here. Uh, I want to thank you for joining uh, this special Facebook Live. Uh, this has been an incredible week in the county of San Diego. Uh, we started the week with the swearing in of three uh, new supervisors. Uh, we went uh, to our next day where we did committee appointments. I was honored to be selected as chair of the board. Um, and you know what we're laying out between then and, and rolling into next Tuesday's meeting uh, is kind of what we're calling our framework for the future. Uh, these are some policy uh, changes and, and beginning to initiate really structural change, uh, beginning to relook at everything we do as a county, how we do it, and how do we create the framework so we can bring all of the policies uh, to really advance our county and move it uh, in a new direction. And I'm so excited and thrilled uh, to have joining us today, uh, my new colleague, uh, Supervisor Tara Lawson Reamer. Uh, Tara and I are co docketing uh, the policy we're going to talk about here today around fiscal policy and, and how we examine budgetary procedures and fiscal policies um, of, a, of a, the largest government entity in San Diego County uh, and, and how we prioritize and, and how we structurally rethink how we do things so that we can make uh, strategic investments, wise investments, substantive investments uh, in a way that gets the best outcome for the taxpayers. And before we start, so I am thrilled. So Tara, I think to my knowledge, you're the first economist we've ever had uh, on the Board of Supervisors. So when we're gonna talk about making smart fiscal policies, there's nothing better than having an economist, uh, but you are so much more than that. A, a lawyer, an advocate, uh, a mom, uh, you have such a tremendous range of experience. You bring so much to our Board of Supervisors uh, and I'm really, really excited. So maybe before we jump into the policy, just tell folks just a little bit about yourself. Some folks who who may are just checking in and, and not from your district and, and really learning and following a lot of what we're doing here at the county. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Fletcher. I'm just so excited to be um, on the board and have the opportunity to work with you to take the county in a new direction. I'm a third generation San Diegan. Um, my grandpa was a Marine uh, stationed at Camp Pendleton. And uh, then I had the opportunity to work in the Obama administration as a senior advisor in the Treasury Department. Uh, I've been a professor uh, teaching public policy um, and have worked with the World Bank and the United Nations on helping economies around the world recover from crises and tackle environmental pollution and take on, um, on big oil companies. So it's just uh, a, a great privilege and uh, honor to be able to bring that expertise back to my own community where I'm now raising my own daughter. Um, she's 17 months now, so she's quite a handful, and uh, but definitely motivates me to do the work to, to turn the county around and, and take us in a better direction. How's your first week going? So you are all of what, five days in? Five, five, days. five days supervisor. Five days. Yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. Um, I just think it's, uh, it's a real honor to, to serve with you and with uh, Supervisor Vargas. And, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I have some hope uh, for my relationship with uh, Supervisor Desmond and certainly looking forward to working with Supervisor Anderson. So I think we've got a good team. Um, and then certainly um, uh, 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 the county employees who are on the front lines every single day fighting COVID and, and doing the work to serve our community and uh, having an opportunity to serve them and help them do their jobs. Um, I think this is just going to be um, a really uh, dynamic couple years where we have the opportunity to make make big strides, make really big strides. Hope hope springs eternal uh, on all of those points, uh, on, on, on all of those points. So, well, one of the things, Sarah, I know, going back to your candidate days, even before you were here, was you saying, look, there, 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 there's a lot of things that, that we ought to be looking at from a fiscal policy. There's a lot of things we ought to be looking at when it comes to making investments. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things in, and, and I know you were pushing those before. And so to be able to get your expertise in here and, you know, just for folks out there that, that may not really know the history, I mean, a lot of the current mindset of the county really was shaped by 20 or 30 years ago. The county got itself in a devastating financial situation, uh, you know, was on the brink of insolvency and bankruptcy, and, and that's a, a really bad situation. But a lot of things were put in place to respond to that crisis. And a lot of those things are legacy carryover mindsets, policies, procedures. And I am certainly mindful that the day I was sworn into the legislature uh, in, in, in 2008, we had a $42 billion deficit on hundred billion total. So we wanna be fiscally responsible. We never wanna to return to those days. Uh, but a lot of those things really hamstring our ability to make investments and, and do the, 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 the types of things that we need to do. And so the, the letter we're bringing forward uh, really is about reevaluating all of our procedures, all of our fiscal policies with an eye towards how do we do the greatest good 
for the greatest number uh, in a fiscally uh, responsible way. And so if it passes, it'll create a subcommittee, it'll be Supervisor uh, Lawson Reamer and myself, and we will begin the difficult, tedious, hard work of plowing through all of these, bringing in experts, looking at best practices, how do we maximize how we get state and federal funds, local funds, uh, really maximize what we do. Uh, but Tara, I know you've brought some really specific kind of thoughts of things that you would like to see us uh, explore as we move forward. And I, I wanna see if you'd share a few of those. Yeah, I, I well, first of all, I, I appreciate your background. I mean, I, mean, I think that's exactly right. Um, we are committed to the best fiscal practices uh, and being fiscally responsible. And the question is, you know, how do you do that? How do you make sure that the resources that the county has, the $6.3 billion that the county is uh, charged with spending is spent in a way that is most effective, most impactful, uh, brings the best benefit, the biggest benefit to the residents, the communities of San Diego County. Um, and so I think that's the th one of the things I'm most excited about in, the, in our uh, first a, a board meeting where we're, we're going to be um, moving forward some policy agenda items next week. Um, so just to, to dive into some of the nitty gritty, uh, one of the things I've been looking at is um, uh, called evidence-based policy making. So there's been a real move over the last 20 years at the federal level, at the national level, in sort of more the cutting edge uh, development, global development agencies to ensure that you're evaluating programs for impact, that you're building in a learning agenda from the outset so that you're evaluating outcomes, you're gathering data, and you know what's working and what's not working. And then that way you can scale up successes and sort of pivot from things that are not, not working as well as we would hope, right? Because I think we're all often aligned on the outcomes we're trying to achieve. We're aligned on the fact that we need to reduce homelessness. We need to reduce uh, food insecurity in our county. We need to ensure that people have access to good jobs. We need to make sure that kids in foster care are getting the care that they need. I mean, there's really, really vital uh, work that the county does to serve the community. Uh, but oftentimes we don't really know whether one approach is better than another approach because we don't have the data and we haven't th thought from the front end about how to evaluate these programs. Um, so there's a, a, been a big push to stand up offices um, that have been led often by a chief evaluation officer or someone like that, that brings data science and best practices and data and learning and monitoring and evaluation to uh, programs um, across the ecosystem of the work that we do in all sorts of agencies. And that's one of the things I wanna see happening at the county. Um, and I know I, I have a particular place in my heart for this coming from an academic background, um, I, you know, the, the research I've done in my own career. And I, there's this huge gap between the knowledge that's often sort of locked up in our academies. And you, you, you might read a journal article with an interesting insight, but it never gets uh, translated in action. And we have a chance to do that here. Um, the other thing I've been uh, really focused on is uh, cost benefit accounting. So basically, this means that when we look at our budget, when we look at our accounting, we're taking account both the benefits and the costs of our programs and our expenditures so that we're not just looking at um, how much something costs on the front end. We're also looking at how much money that might save on the back end. And this is how Congress looks at budget models. This is how uh, the best practices at the World Bank or just countries to use in looking at budget models. Uh, because at the, at the end of the day, you know, it's obviously better uh, to spend 10 cents on the front end and save a dollar on the back end, right? And I think this is pretty common sense, but it's not the way we think about our county programs at all. Uh, so an example would be in um, the criminal justice system and making sure that when we think about expenses associated with recidivism prevention, that we're not just counting those as a cost, we're also looking at how successful those programs are at preventing folks from ending up back in our prison pipeline. Um, and therefore the savings that we can generate from pe keeping people out of jail on the other side. Uh, looking at homelessness, you know, if we do a better job of making sure that people um, are not going into crisis early, then we are going to save thousands and thousands of dollars because we're not uh, calling out fire and EMT and police, um, you know, for, for a call that could have been avoided with a few hundred dollars on um, upfront investments to get someone the help that they need. Uh, and that's complicated. This is not something we're going to do overnight. So uh, 
realigning how we look at our accounting practices to ensure we're looking at costs and as well as benefits is a you know, it's going to take a lot of consultation with um, some of the experts around the world who've done this in other places. It's going to take time. It's going to take data. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, this is the kind of long run commitment to the health and well being and vitality and uh, fiscal responsibility uh, for the taxpayers and communities of San Diego um, that's going to pay off in the long run. You know, we, we're not going to see results next year, or the year after, but we're certainly going to be in, you know, five, six, seven years from now uh, reaping the rewards for having having been thoughtful and forward looking in ensuring that uh, our county government is um, sort of at the very core of uh, being realigned to ensure that resources are delivering as much as possible for the communities in need. No, and I, I you, you raised such a such a key point about, I mean, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum, right? I mean, it's all interconnected. And, and we do have a problem if we just look at what is the expense of doing this and not look at what is the expense of not doing it. Right. Um, and I think one of the challenges too that, that makes this so complex and so interesting is, you know, for example, like if we take the jail health system, like I, I think it needs to be done in a fundamentally different way, right? And it will cost us a lot more money. But my point is we're going to pay that either way. I mean, it's morally right to get people well and healthy, get them treatment for mental health, substance abuse, get their underlying health conditions gone, and then integrate them into the system when they come out. But if we don't do it, we're just perpetuating the cycle of addiction uh, incarceration, poverty over and over and over again. But then you run into the problem of it's different entities that will be saving money, right? So if, if the county is a, is a public health agency, spends all of this money and we lower recidivism, well, then that saves maybe law enforcement money, but that money doesn't necessarily come back. And, and it's just figuring out how you navigate through all that. Or, or uh, a program we launched last year is our countywide mobile crisis response team, right? So that we are sending a trained clinician not law enforcement to deal with the uh, individual. Not a, they're not a danger to themselves or anyone else. They're they're in crisis, and again, that's going to offload a considerable burden on the part of the cities, and the county's going to pay for it. But you know what? That that's okay because we're all trying to trying to navigate through this through this the same. And it's it is it's, it's hard, but if you can measure that, and then you can start looking at the savings. Okay, we're going to spend a dollar, but it's going to save us a dollar fifty in the long term. Then that's an investment worth doing and then you monitor your way through it and if what you predicted didn't come through then you reevaluate if you continue it or not that's right i mean i think yeah. a lot of my work uh in my career has looked at how you know when we're accounting for things we do a better job on delivering on those goals and objectives um because when you when you can't you know sort of put a number to it or uh, describe more concretely what it is that you're trying to do, um, then you can't really track it, right? And so a lot of what, um, you know, I think what we're gonna be doing over the next couple of years is translating um, what we know intuitively, right? Which we know we know through stories, which is exactly what you just said, which is we, we can, uh, it's something might uh, have a, a kind of a hefty price tag on the front end in terms of uh, dealing with mental health crises in our community, but it saves a lot on the back end um, in so many ways, and not just in our law enforcement, but also in, uh, you know, the well-being of families and the health of families and, you know, performance of kids in schools, right? There's a lot of ways in which there's ripple effects. Uh, and we know this, but um, we haven't done a very good job of figuring out how to account for that in um, the way we think about our budgets and our co and looking at more dynamic modeling. And I mean, you know, managing expectations, right? Like this is hard. We're not going to be able to get it perfect. We're not going to be able to account for everything. Uh, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, and it's going to be an evolving process. So we're not going to get it right, you know, even even on day, you know, year two or year three. But, um, you know, if we just, I, I think what we're really interested in is changing the framework so that we know where we're going and it's iterative and we improve it and we do a little bit better every year, knowing we're not perfect, but at least we are thinking about the question in the right way. And we're really thinking about how do you benefit the communities with the expenditures that we're making as a county. Yeah, and providing that framework because, you know, you and I won't be here forever. At some point folks right. are gonna come you know, behind us, but if we if we do the hard work for many years to provide that framework, then it just becomes a way that everything gets done and then they'll tweak and modify and you'll say, I mean, it is it is a continual process, uh, but it's just kind of moving in a new direction. And, you know, the same is true on a lot of county policies. Um, you know, I think reserves uh, for government agencies are really important because, you know, in government, when, when, you're, when your revenues go down, your tax revenues, you know, if you're in business and your revenues go down, your costs go down as well, minus your fixed costs, but your variable costs go down as well. And in government, we have the opposite problem, 
uh, as our revenues go down, our fixed costs stay the same. Our variable costs go up because more people need help and more people need services. And so you have you know, reserves to draw out of during a time of difficulty to tide you through uh, until you get to good times. But I think that there has been a lot of, of, of very accurate pointed questions and criticism about the size of the county reserves. Again, we wanna have reserves to use to draw from during a period of crisis and difficulty so that we don't have to cut services, uh, but really evaluating what is a best practice from an accounting standard, from a, a best practice for how much governments should have. Because you know, if you, if you tip too far one way, you can obviously get in fiscal problems and, and have to do serious cuts to programs. But if you tip too far other way, you aren't fulfilling your mission, you know, your mission to provide services to folks. And so, you know, I know that's another issue that, that we have to tackle is, is, is the issue of, of, you know, how do you right size those, those reserves? Yeah, I, and you hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, it's it's about best practices. It's about just taking a fresh look and make sure making sure that we're not, um, you know, stuck in uh, an approach that's been ossified since the 80s, and, you know, and, and and been left behind by some of the advances and evolutions in how we should think about um, reserves and budgeting, uh, particularly because clearly market conditions have changed a lot since, um, you know, runaway inflation in, in the Carter administration, right? So right. there's, <laughs> we're in a different world and, uh, you know, we need to take account of the actual realities that we live in. Yeah. And then another thing we just have to look at is there, there's so many of these just individual policies, uh, you know, that are, that, are, that have been have been put in place, and uh, I'll just share a couple of them that are, you know, we talked about the reserves. There's there's a, a, a random limitation on how many health and human services staff we can have, and it's based on tie to the population, but it doesn't exist for any other entity. And some of this, I think, is is rooted in just kind of a culture of outsourcing, uh, and you know, there may be times where where that that would make sense to do, but but you know, in a lot of instances, you lose an aspect of oversight and control and integration uh, and knowing knowing what you're getting. And and so, you know, a lot of these things as it relates to fees or, or this is an ongoing or recurring program, it really precludes our county uh, from being able to go out and get grant funding and get state funding and get federal funding and get things that, you know, maybe, okay, you know, we're gonna kick in a dollar, but there's a $3 match. Um, and, and we have policies in place that prevent us from doing those, those, a lot of those types of creative things. And, you know, I know that's an area that we really want to dive into as, as, as we work across. Definitely. I, so just on the contracting front, I mean, I think there's really three considerations, right? When we're thinking, you know, does it make sense to do something, you know, in-house or to contract out? One is what's the best strategy to, to generate matching funds from federal and state entities? You know, what do we need to do to get those multiplier effects? Um, and it might be contracting, it might be in-house, but you sort of have to think about that on the front end because generating the resources for our community is our number one priority. Um, I think the second thing is how do we deliver the best services? And that goes back to the to the first question that I raised, right, which is looking at program impact and being accountable for results and, and really looking at what's gonna be the most effective. And so just being mindful of where we're prioritizing, how do we deliver the best results we can for our communities? Um, but the third thing is how do you deliver the best results uh, over time and in the long run, not just in the short run? Uh, so one of the advantages of uh, when you have long-term reoccurring programs that are always part of what the county does um, about ensuring that they're delivered in a sustainable way is that then you've built in the capacity to have a learning agenda to do things that aren't maybe that great the first time but the next time they're better and the next time they're better um, and and that kind of learning and that kind of capacity for delivering really high quality results for um, you know the people of our community is has to be one of our top priorities and you know, you look at, I, I just take the, this COVID crisis as an example. And, you know, I think uh, in other countries that has, that have invested more in ensuring that they have uh, federal public health systems that, ha that have, you know, that are ongoing and sustainable and robust, um, they're, they're having a lot uh, easier time in addressing COVID because they have those, um, those uh, capacities that are built in and, and we just don't have them, um, you know, certainly not at our federal level. So it's sort of a lesson learned about making sure we're thinking long-term about how to make sure that the, we're getting the results, um, the best possible service for, for the folks who need it in San Diego County. 
No, I like that. So we, we have a ton to do. And then the procurement system, we haven't even talked about really opening up the procurement uh, process and system to be more transparent, uh, easy to access and make sure that everyone's got a fair shot, you know, and engaging with their county government. I, there's probably a lot of opportunity there as well. Agreed. I mean, especially because uh, a lot of times, uh, especially community service providers that might be best positioned to actually know the needs of the communities, the impacted communities, uh, might not be as savvy around some of those procurement processes because they're, they're so busy actually doing the work to serve the community that, they, that they're not really looped in to some of these um, procurement uh, standards and practices. And so we really want to be open that up and make sure that the best folks who, who really are in touch with what the needs are, are the ones who are who are able to do the work. Yeah, I think out of all the things we're doing, I mean, this is one of the most important one because budgets and budgetary decisions really are a, it's a moral statement of values and, and where you want to go and the, the mechanism or the, the guide rails around how you do that guide the decisions get made, which guide the lives that get touched. And so I actually think uh, what we're doing here um, is really going to be transformative for the county and, um, you know, really coming in and, and, you know, it's interesting when I was sworn in two years ago, uh, I think the average supervisor had been here, I don't know, 27 years. Uh, and uh, when you all got sworn in on Monday, then I guess the average went, well, Desmond and I had two years and you all had a day. So, you know, you do the math on that, you know, we're, we're, we're not talking about much. Um, but I think that's an opportunity, you know, that that is the opportunity, which is you have folks who have tremendous experience tremendous experience from all walks. You have incredible experience. Supervisor Vargas has incredible experience. Supervisor Anderson has tremendous experience. And so everyone brings a, a, a responsible governing sense and, and their own life experience, but it's a huge fresh set of eyes. And, yeah. and you know, to say, why do we do that? Maybe there's a reason why, maybe. And maybe that reason existed in 1997 and doesn't exist today, or maybe it does. But but to be willing to challenge everything and say, why do we do it? Why do we do it that way? Well, what if yeah. we did it this way or that way? And to spend the time, uh, I think is is really going to be be something incredible. So I am, I am excited. I hope I hope it passes on Tuesday. Uh, I, I suspect it will, but you never uh, you never take anything for granted. And so, uh, you know, I hope it passes, and then really really look forward to uh, to, to working with you on this issue. And uh, just thank you a ton for uh, for taking the time. One for running. Running is difficult. It's hard. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about running for office, but being willing to go through it. Uh, and then, and then for what I know you're going to bring to our board. So, uh, why don't you close this out? And, uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to watching and, and I really appreciate Tara, uh, the work we're doing on this and the work we're going to do on, on, on everything else in the coming years. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for, for, uh, uh leading the charge, Nathan. So, um, you know, can't promise there'll be results tomorrow, but definitely promise we're going to, we're digging in already to, to get there. Wonderful. All right, Tara, thank you. Thank you everyone for uh, for joining us. Make sure you tune into the board meeting Tuesday uh, and we'll post in the comments how you can register your support uh, and uh, and join our, our board meeting to uh, speak if, if you would like or certainly watch the deliberation and be a part of your county government action. So thanks everyone. Have a good day.